The Algonquin people have inhabited and cared for these lands since time immemorial. We take this time to express our gratitude and respect to them and to the land for all it has provided and will continue to provide. As a post-secondary institution, we acknowledge the harms done as indigenous people, to Indigenous peoples and are committed to learning from the past. We pledge to promote healing and resilience as we move forward in partnership with the Algonquin Nations, First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples at a spirit of reconciliation. While we recognize that territorial acknowledgements are only one step in cultivating greater respect for and inclusion of Indigenous peoples, we commit to accompanying these words with actions. We are dedicated to building a future and a community that is better for all. We pledge to continue exploring and making meaningful contributions to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action. I'm very excited to host everyone here today in Nawapin and online and gather your feedback on how the Ottawa campus will develop over the next decade. Our current master campus development plan was, was completed in 2015 and was due to be renewed in 2020. It focused solely on the Ottawa campus and provided high level guidance on priorities for the development and maintenance of the campus. In 2020, the foundational principles were approved by the Board of Governors, but the completion of the Master Campus Development Plan was paused during the pandemic. At this time, I'd like to welcome President and CEO of Algonquin College, Claude Brulé, to say a few words. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. Good evening. Bonjour à tous et à tous. Koe kakena. Claude Brulé in Indigenous. My name is Claude Burley, as Ryan said, and I'm the president and CEO of Algonquin College. My pleasure to welcome you this evening, uh, both those in person and those joining us online, uh, for what will be a dynamic uh, presentation of our vision for the future of our campuses, and we look forward to your engagement in those conversations. We're pleased to be hosting uh, this event this evening with our uh, college ward councillor and deputy mayor, Lane Johnson. Welcome to you and to members of uh, your team this evening. We really value the City of Ottawa as a partner in uh, helping us to shape the future built uh, environment of the Ottawa campus, uh, as it not only impacts our learners and our employees, but also our neighboring communities and our broader community partners as well. The Master Campus Development Plan, as Ryan said, is our roadmap uh, that will guide the evolution of our campus over the next decade. But it's not just a plan about buildings and development. It's also about creating vibrant, uh, future-focused, and sustainable environment where everyone can see themselves learn, uh, live in some cases, if you're in our residence, work, and play. So we've approached this endeavor with the needs of our learners, of course, our employees, and our community partners at top of mind. It's our goal to ensure that the future developments will benefit our entire community as we continue to first focus on academic excellence, second, provide a fantastic learning and working environment, and three, uh, contribute to the economic prosperities of the communities we serve. So, big order uh, in, in order for us to uh, achieve those goals that uh, we set out. I really want to thank you, uh, both in person and those joining online, for being with us this evening. This is your opportunity to engage, to ask questions, and provide input. So I hope um, you have an enjoyable evening. Thank you very much, and I would like to call upon Lane Johnson to come and say a few words. Lane. Uh, salut tout le monde. Je m'appelle Lane Johnson. Je suis la conseillère pour la Quartier Collège. And uh, I just wanted to say, you know, to reiterate uh, many of the words that Claude has offered, but to sort of contextualize it in the neighborhoods. You know, when I was first running for office, when I was knocking on doors, many of our neighbors were, you know, feeling sort of the pressure of a growing college, wanted to understand what the vision was you know, wanted to be able to make our, our neighborhoods welcoming spaces for everyone, understood the need for truly affordable housing, but felt anxious about the fact that, you know, our neighborhoods weren't accommodating 
uh, the students where they needed it most. And, um, and so one of my campaign promises was to create a town and gown structure where we could you know, liaise more regularly with the college. And although we haven't had the um, exact same tone uh, as the town and gown in Sandy Hill, uh, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, we have an opportunity to sort of, you know, lead uh, right from the beginning and co-create and, and shape what the vision of a growing community will be. And I've been very grateful uh, to the open doors that the college has shown me. Um, we've been able to integrate, you know, with this plan, there were city planners who sat on that team so that we could have that sort of back and forth and dialogue with the rest of the area. And similarly, when we plan for the Algonquin Station secondary plan, which is going to be the site around the LRT station, we'll have representation from Algonquin College there. So, you know, really trying to create you know, a shared community. I think we have a tremendous opportunity in this area to become, you know, really known for its vibrant student life, for its uh, cultural dynamism, for its diversity. Um, and we do have now 100 Constellation coming online in 2026, which is hectares of land to do the same. Uh, so things that come to mind and that I've continued to press for is, you know, what about new daycare spaces? Can Algonquin College help us to, um, you know, steward more daycare spaces on city land, for example, when that comes online because of the great pro program that they have? What can the city learn from Algonquin's uh, indigenous uh, truth and sec reconciliation efforts for which they have, you know, really embodied the spirit of, of both truth and reconciliation with their actions. How can the city demonstrate its commitment to that as, you know, a landowner and, you know, of stolen land? So I think there's a lot of ways that we're going to be able to work together. And I'm just, again, so grateful for the openness and the willingness to, you know, think about this as a shared space. And I, I'm really looking forward to the presentation tonight. And by all means, you can certainly never uh, hit a wrong door when you want to come and talk to me about anything, but if you want to come and talk to me about this, I'll help you find your way as well. Thank you. Thank you, President Brule and, and Councillor Lane Johnson. So over the last year and a half, facilities management and the consultant team have initiated engagement sessions with the Board of Governors key leaders at the college, external stakeholders near the campuses, our learners and the academic area to better understand the future requirements of our three campuses. A cross-college working group has guided the development of this plan. This working group reported and reports to and received guidance from the Integrated College Development Planning Steering Committee, one of the college's senior committees. The plan seeks to address the college's deferred maintenance liability develop options to support student housing, and uh, accommodate anticipated enrollment growth over the next decade. Supporting the framework plan, technical studies were engaged to determine the current conditions on our Ottawa campus. The team also coordinated with the City of Ottawa, as mentioned by Councillor Lane Johnson, to ensure that we integrate with their official plans and maintain our position as a collaborative partner within our communities. We consulted with the college community previously in May and then again earlier today for the development of the plan and incorporated the comments and considerations into this final draft. Now that the college has a better developed plan, we're asking for public feedback uh, to ensure that we have a fulsome understanding of the college and community needs. This feedback will be considered and incorporated into the final plan and we're planning to seek Board of Governors approval in February of 2025 for this plan. So this is not the only consultation uh, opportunity. We will be consulting tomorrow with members of the Pembroke campus and the city of Pembroke. Today, the team will present the plan and offer up an opportunity to ask questions. Once the formal presentation, questions and answers are complete, we invite those that are here in person uh, to stay behind and review the panels that are set up around the room in an open house format and engage one-on-one -on -one with the consultant team uh, or members of my team, facilities management. For those that are online, uh, there will be a survey uh, where you can provide feedback on what you've heard and what we should consider as we build out this draft plan over uh, the remainder of the fall. 
So the draft plan is up uh, for review on the college website. Uh, I'd ask if you, if you want to review it, go to the college website, search for MCDP, and then click on news, and it'll take you to a PDF version of the current plan. And you can go through the whole 150 pages of it uh, at re right now and provide your feedback on, on all of that. Uh, so as we move through tonight, I, I kindly ask that any questions be held uh, till the end of the question and answer period of our session. And uh, I'd like to now welcome you to watch the, uh, the video that we prepared uh, in preparation for this event. And following that, Carolyn Jones, principal from GRC Architects, will begin our presentation. Thank you very much. Algonquin College is embracing a bright future with its new master campus development plan. Designed to transform our learning environments to best match the needs of our learners. Provide a dynamic modern workplace for our faculty and employees. Embrace sustainability, accessibility, and indigenous ways of knowing. And build a thriving and welcoming environment for the entire Algonquin College community. One that will lay a foundation for a new generation of post-secondary success. At the heart of our strategic vision lies the Master Campus Development Plan, a comprehensive roadmap to guide the evolution of our campuses over the next decade. This plan is not just about buildings. It's about creating vibrant, accessible, sustainable environments conducive to contemporary learning and collaboration. Now we're approaching this endeavor in alignment with the needs of our learners, employees, and community partners who range from local municipalities, First Nations communities, our immediate campus neighbors, and industry sector employers who help guide our programming and hire our graduates. We are aligning our academic plan and our new strategic plan goals with the needs of our employers, setting an exciting blueprint for the future that will continue to focus on academic excellence provide a fantastic working environment, and help drive forward the economic prosperity of the communities we serve. As stewards of the college's facilities and infrastructure assets, we understand the importance of aligning our resources with our strategic goals. The Master Campus Development Plan not only addresses our anticipated enrollment growth, but also provides recommendations to ease deferred maintenance liabilities. Through strategic investments, we aim to create spaces that attract and retain talent, while also promoting innovation and excellence, providing the entire Algonquin College community with a fantastic environment to learn, work, play, and live. As the college looks to transform its built environment, it is of the utmost importance that sustainability Accessibility and indigenization remain at the forefront of all construction and design decisions. The college's celebrated history of embracing green building techniques has been seen largely through its numerous leadership in energy and environmental design accolades. LEED certifications are globally recognized green building credentials that reflect efforts to build eco-friendly and human-focused environments. The college's five most recently constructed buildings all have LEED certification, ranging from silver to platinum. Alongside the college's LEED certifications, three of its buildings have received Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Recognition, which measures and awards the level of access found in a given environment. Future builds will seek to continue and improve upon the college's accessibility efforts to ensure that the college continues to be a place where everyone can participate and succeed. Future builds are also expected to incorporate elements that reflect the college's indigenization strategy. Indigenous knowledge, tradition and imagery run throughout the entirety of the college's built environment. And this commitment to indigeneity and our indigenous partners will continue to be a significant showcase in the future of the college's campuses. We're working on turning vision into reality. From assessing current space needs to envisioning future building designs, our team is dedicated to ensuring that our campuses evolve in sync with our academic, employee, and community requirements. Through careful planning and execution, we aim to create spaces that inspire learning, collaboration, and inclusivity. 
From high-level strategic goals to concrete steps on the ground, the Master Campus Development Plan represents a commitment to excellence and innovation. As we look ahead, let's reflect on the progress made, the impact envisioned, and the exciting future awaiting us. Join us as we embark on this transformative journey, shaping not only our campuses, but also the futures of generations to come. Together, we'll build a legacy of excellence, sustainability, and community engagement. Thank you for joining us on this remarkable endeavor. Um, good evening, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so I just wanted to start by uh, introducing the consultant team that uh, has been working with the college on the development of the Master Campus Development Plan. So I'm Carolyn Jones, I'm a principal at GRC Architects and uh, the team lead for the Campus Development Consortium or the CDC team for the campus, for the college. And I'm joined by Urban Strategies. Um, we have, excuse me, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, we have Tim Smith who is uh, a principal at Urban Strategies and Eric Turcotte who is a partner as well as Andrew Toth, who's an associate uh, at Urban Strategies. And uh, Urban Strategies has extensive experience in developing campus master plans for colleges and universities. Um, also on the team, a key member is Michel de Jacques from Educational Consulting Services, ECS. They have extensive experience in functional programming and space planning for post-secondary institutions and has done several studies over many years since pretty much the opening of the college. <laughs> um, we also have on the team M uh, Morrison Hirschfield, now Stantec, providing technical advisory support in the fields of transportation, water management, energy, and uh, infrastructure services. So just briefly, uh, the agenda for the evening. Um, we'll go through the introduction, the draft MCDP, so the planning context, the guiding principles and big moves, the long-term framework plans, and the short-term development strategy. And then we'll leave about 10 minutes or so for questions and answers, and uh, then we're happy to be here to um, discuss with anyone any questions they have about the panels that are around the room. So with that, I will pass it on to Dr. Simon Spooner for the introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Caroline. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Delighted uh, that you can all come here and uh, listen to what we've got for you this evening. So my name is Dr. Simon Spooner. I'm the Associate Director of Facilities Planning and Sustainability and also uh, responsible for this project, uh, working with this dynamic individuals that Caroline has just uh, mentioned. And uh, the Master Campus Plan is a, is a guide. It's a map, it's a direction, a uh, consulting guide, uh, and it will enable us to plan the development and growth for the college's three physical campuses over the next 10 years uh, and beyond. And some of the notes you'll see later on, we're talking 25 years, you know, long-term vision, which is very important. It establishes the framework and guidelines for all the new buildings that uh, you heard Ryan talk about, new buildings that we're going to be contemplating over the next decade and beyond. And look at the infrastructure and the open spaces and make sure that we are providing that uh, direction for sustainable growth, uh, enhancing the uh, campus experiences, uh, making it better for our learners and our, our students. Uh, identifying the short-term projects to accommodate our academic and supporting infrastructure needs on again on all three campuses that we're looking at. And we're addressing, looking at academic space, the housing issue in the situation, and the social space and amenities. How can we make things better for everybody? And as you've heard from Caroline, we have a dynamic, uh, well-experienced team, which I'm delighted to lead. And within the college itself, 
we've had a lot of input, very importantly, the senior college leadership, which is great. We've had uh, impact from the students and staff uh, with their thoughts and their comments. We've got a working group of over 50 strong of, of, of the brightest and the best across the whole of the campus, which is great to get their intake. Uh, we've had the Board of Governors, uh, which we've presented to and kept up to date with their recommendations and their guidance, which is so important for a major project of this necessary. And over the last two years, we started off with phase one, identifying the needs. What are the opportunities? What direction? Where are we aiming to go? And phase two, establishing the framework. What are the opportunities? What are the development scenarios? Let's see how we can get those together. And then phase three, which is putting it all together, putting this master plan, this document. And our objective is to have this document ready uh, by Christmas so that we can then present it to the Board of Governors uh, next February for their recommendation. So how will the plan be used? Well, as I said, it's a guide. It guides future campus development. Whenever we do improvements to the campus and initiatives, we should be referring to this document for guidance. The initiatives not identified in the plan will be assessed against the principles which are outlined in this document, the vision and framework that we have put together, and the designing guidelines and it will inform the design of future projects, where they should go. Where they should not go is just as important as where they should go. We don't want to put something in the wrong place which will hinder development in the future. The campus development projects to demonstrate the consistency of the plan and really to inform decisions by senior leadership. Here they have a document, uh, a guidance strategy of where we should be going, how we should be going, and that will enable the Board of Governors on the future campus developments to make those decisions. And uh, it now is my great pleasure to hand over Tim Smith from Urban Strategies. Thank you, Simon. Uh, good evening, everybody. So over the next 20 minutes or so, my colleague Eric and I will kind of take you through the MCDP, draft MCDP, an overview of it, hit the highlights of it, uh, and then welcome your questions and comments after, as you've, as you've heard. I want to start by kind of just setting the context for the MCDP. What, what are the kind of bigger challenges and opportunities that the plan is responding to and, and recognizing? First of all, um, in many respects, it's a pretty great campus. In fact, over the last 10 or to 15 years, uh, the college has built some kind of quite remarkable buildings that you see illustrated here, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, at least from, from the outside. Most recently, the Athletic and Recreation Center building um, at the, the north edge of the campus. And as you heard in the video, most of these buildings all have lead rating of, of one type or another, so really kind of showing a lot of leadership with respect to sustainability. So these are buildings that the plan kind of just works around, recognizing how strong they are and that they will continue to be assets over the long-term uh, future for the campus. Now, there's a flip side to the story. <laughs> there's actually a lot of buildings, too, that are quite old. This is a campus that goes back to 1967. Uh, and we have a number of buildings, including the buildings that we're in, that were built in those early days. These are legacy buildings, and frankly, the way they were built, uh, and even their architecture, whether you love them or not, means they're going to be here for a long time. It wouldn't make sense to ever replace these buildings. But as you can see in this illustration, there are quite a few other buildings that are in poor condition. And the news could get worse. If there aren't investments in those buildings or other decisions made about those buildings, there's going to be a lot of money to be spent to simply maintain them. What's quite clear to us and to uh, the, the facilities group here at the college is that it's really time to rethink and start to transform the college by actually demolishing some of these buildings. It'll make a much more sense to replace them with bigger academic and mixed-use buildings that make better use of the land and take that money you might spend in simply repairing outdated facilities and putting it to new modern, modern spaces. So this is a real focus of the plan. You're going to see lots of pictures about more buildings and growth. And yes, the college is going to grow uh, and add students steadily over time, over the long term. But it's really a, a quite a more immediate need to actually begin to address the, the maintenance issue and really fundamentally improve some of, some of the existing facilities. And here's a picture from, from Navajo Drive of 
some of those facilities that not only are a bit outdated, but really don't use the land very well. They're one, maybe two-story buildings. And from Navajo, I think we can maybe agree this isn't the prettiest side of the college. So what can we do over time to really transform that, that image? Now, flipping from buildings to open spaces, out here, oh, you can see the lights. Yeah, it's lovely. This is a wonderful space that the college has, has created over the last several years. Um, probably it's best outside green space. And as you can see, well used. But from our perspective, the college could use even more of these types of green spaces as gathering places, uh, as somewhere for passive enjoyment, as just simply green spaces where nature can thrive and contribute to the sustainability of the campus. Housing. <laughs> We can uh, all imagine that the housing crisis is affecting everyone, including colleges. Uh, there's a demand for more housing by, by students, so it is anticipated that over the next decade there will be more housing built uh, on, the college, on the college to meet that growing demand. And then looking beyond the boundaries of the Ottawa campus, you have to recognize the world around the campus is also changing and evolving, uh, as the counselor uh, mentioned earlier. To the south, we have really relatively stable neighborhoods. And by the way, who's here from City View neighborhood? Some of you live in City View? Oh, as a group over here, they must maybe know each other. Are there some folks from Bel Air Heights? Anyone from Bel Air Heights here? Ah, okay, the counselor from Bel Air Heights. How about Center Point? And a couple from Center Point. Great, so we've got a, a mix here. That's great. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, those neighborhoods, when you kind of get away from the area around the future Algonquin Station, pretty stable. You probably don't want the character of those neighbors to change all that much. Um, but the pink area there around the college is set to transform over the coming decades as the O-Train comes to the campus. And so we have to recognize that College Square, for example, that retail development over time is, is going to evolve with higher density development, probably more housing, maybe some other uses. And so how is the college going to respond to that? How should the campus uh, developed to actually have a relationship to that future development, and as well as development on the west side of Woodruff. We have some ideas about that we'll tell you about. Okay, so let's get into the document itself. Um, we actually began the planning work, believe it or not, pre-COVID, back in 2019. Looking back at the, the principles the college was using for master planning and develop, updating them and, and developing some new ones. And those were adopted by the Board of Governors in 2020. And if you want to look at them closely, they're over there on, on, this, on panel number two. I'm not gonna spend a great deal of time on them now, just because there's quite a, few, um, that, quite a few of them there to go through. But a lot of thought was put in those. We spent several months actually developing them, engaging with folks on the campus for feedback. And we really feel they provide a, provide a solid foundation. So here on the screen, you see some of the themes behind those principles, um, stewardship, sustainability, identity, place, community connectivity. This really speaks to, as Claude was saying, the partnerships that are so fundamental to the college's success. And for a moment, oh, no, I wanna to flip to big moves next. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about sustainability in a moment. The next foundational element of the MCDP are what we're calling big moves. These are kind of the big ideas for what you would try to achieve over the next 10 years and beyond, the big changes to the campus. One of them I've maybe hinted at already by showing you that illustration with all the red buildings to be, uh, to be maintained or demolished. That is to renew and build up the core of the campus, to actually demolish buildings and build new buildings and build them up. So start to grow the campus up as opposed to out and at the same time, um, renew facilities as you do that. And the next big move is to create a more complete, livable, and welcoming campus. I keep forgetting the screens over here too, my apologies. Um, so this is a little bit related to the first big move, but actually is looking at not just academic space that needs to be built on the campus and renewed, but also some other uses, more housing, as I mentioned earlier, as well as other amenities that will, will serve students uh, as well as employees. And in fact, we think could actually be a bigger attraction for folks that live around the campus. It could draw you back in um, to, to enjoy those amenities and open spaces. 
Big Blue number three, enhance edges, entries, and connections to the community. I think this will be of interest to a lot of you. I think we recognize that that sort of green edge along the south edge of the campus and wrapping around the east edge is a nice kind of buffer between the college and the neighborhood. Uh, we think it's probably worked fairly well as a kind of buffer. We actually see an opportunity, which Eric will talk a little bit more, to actually even enhance that as a green space. It's something that almost becomes a bit of a linear park that's not only something students and employees can enjoy, but as well as those neighbors uh, around the campus. And then represented by the pink lines here, the purple lines here, that whole idea of improving that north edge of the campus in particular, beginning to relate to that future development on College Square and generally have a more um, attractive image, uh, edge there. And improving the image of the campus is very much about uh, more landscaping and greening up the campus. It, it will be really key to its identity as a sustainable campus. Um, and that's really represented here by the green lines, which is sort of improved landscapes around future building. But the big move, as you can see right in the middle, is to take the existing open space in front of the student commons and expand it over time to create a, a really big multi-purpose gathering space. And again, Eric will provide a bit more details about the vision behind that. And finally, big move number five, to facilitate, uh, safely facilitate all travel modes. Algonquin College, the Ottawa campus, serves a vast region. A lot of people are driving here and will continue to drive here. It's just a fact of, of, its, of its geography. However, we have an O train coming here, and we have a bus transitway planned on Baseline Road, which will come down to Navajo. Transit service is going to improve significantly over time. We need to take advantage of that and really promote it as a way to get to and from the campus. Cycling and pedestrians, Ryan's a cyclist to campus. There's, there's, there's some of them. There aren't a lot yet, but we think with improved infrastructure, more showers, more trails, more pathways, that actually more people will bike, particularly as they start to live closer to the campus. And of course, every campus should be walkable and accessible. Here's where I want to talk about sustainability for a little bit, because we can't take for granted, and it was touched on in the video, how important sustainability is to the college. It rec recognizes its role as a public institution to really set an example for other institutions and for businesses and for society at large about how to be green. And not only because it's environmentally the right thing to do and deals with all those big issues we're, we're confronting, like climate change, but it also makes good economic sense. So these are some of the ways the plan promotes sustainability. First of all, a more compact campus will be more efficient, more energy efficient, use infrastructure efficiently. Um, renovating buildings and building new buildings to a high green standards you heard about in the video, that's almost certainly going to continue. We want to make sure that we have a, a strategy. In fact, there is a strategy outlined in the draft plan for how to be more sustainable from an energy uh, perspective how to integrate stormwater management into to landscapes so that you're not relying on that, on, on pipes so much, promoting, as I mentioned earlier, transit, cycling, walking, and encouraging mixed-use development. Really, the very long-term vision that includes the larger area, as I said, is a very transit-focused, mixed-use node that the college will be a big part of. And with that, it's over to Eric to kind of walk you through more details of the plan. Thank you, Tim. Bonsoir. Uh, my name is Eric Turcotte. So I work with the team in, um, in developing the MCDP, the draft that you see today. And I'm going to walk you into some more specific details about the framework and some of the specific projects, some of the ideas, how we're going to continue to implement and, and move the plan forward. The, the framework is, you know, the reason we need it is to plan for, it's a long term. It's looking way ahead, so we want to ensure that the move we're doing today are coherent, works, you know, in terms of understanding how we're going to continue to grow, and also not to be able to, you know, we, we don't want to be wasteful of the of the um, of the land that we uh, that we're the steward is. So that includes a series of understanding where to build new buildings, where to renew facilities, where to demolish and build, uh, and also where not to build. So it's, it's quite important because there's a series of layers there. We want to understand how we organize the campus from users' perspective, so where we put academic space, 
we, we put uh, students, uh, the learner spaces, and where you potentially put, you know, the residential, the student resident spaces. We want to make sure that it's in the right place from the get-go so we understand to actually maximize the synergy between all these uses. Open space, uh, Tim talked about it, is a crucial piece in terms of enhancing the user's experience of people who are employed here as well as the people that are learning here and you know it's also how we're presenting ourselves to the world and and how we continue to attract you know the best in uh, in the best students and best the best uh, uh, staff to come to the campus and as well as a mobility layer to it about how we move in and around the campus, but also outside, you know, how do we come? How do we access the campus? So the plan looks at all of these, of these layers. From a mobility perspective, we are looking at how do we actually come from transit, how, if you're a pedestrian, how you come to the campus, as well as the cyclists, and we're not forgetting, you know, our cars, because cars are, you know, we know that there's major inv investment happening in transit. We have the an O train that is that is planned in the in the planning process. There is a BRT that eventually on baseline will make its way to Navajo. We have we are actually our transit is coming to our door and it's going to be used more and more uh, by people. So we need to plan ahead. We need to also ensure that the pedestrian, as we come out of the transit, that the pedestrian connection in and out of our, our buildings are actually very seamless, very intuitive, very safe. So that has that layer. There are places that we've currently identified within the campus that need some improvement. And then we're looking at, especially where there are those Carrefour, where the key intersection of these pedestrian path, that there's special moment that can happen to enhance the experience, having some activity hubs into those area. Uh, from a cycling network, in, within the campus, but also how we better connect ourselves to the, you know, the plan network that the city of Ottawa has uh, planned. So that is something that is quite crucial because more and more uh, people are going to be looking at, uh, continue to look for these alternative to get to and from the, the campus. And then we're not forgetting about parking. As you'll see, a lot of the site that we're planning are on existing parking lots. So as we are building new projects. We're going to be always carefully anal analyzing that, what is our parking demand, um, integrating parking within some of these development. Uh, we've identified also a couple of places where potentially parking structure can be built. But those, let's face it, it's going to be monitored as we continue to develop the campus. There's a lot of trends in the investment. So I think it is as we go over the next 5, 10, 15 plus years. And it's how every campus across the country in North America do. They actually reassess their needs. Um, but we want to, we are ensuring and, you know, cars are here to stay. Um, we just have to understand as we continue and study each building. This is an interesting, you know, we, you know, as part of our, our transformation of the campus, this is, um, this is Wajak. It's the street that is currently in front of the uh, student residence. It's the places that is between the, uh, between the common the student resident. We have what we call right to what you see here is the future development of the F site, which is currently has a kind of a, um, a, a a small building that will be uh, will be the commission. It, uh, it is actually is the commission, um, but we see this as being very much part of the heart of the campus. A very special street, almost like a main street of Algonquin College, where we see the future development happening in the north, having some active edges. Um, uh, enhancing the experience in terms of exposing what's happening inside the building. Um, it's planned to be a culinary, the new culinary school there, so seeing what's happening inside, having the restaurant, having some exposure uh, there. So we want to see that, you know, that the, that the, the college has a civic presence and really create a special place. Also a place where we want to see more pedestrianization. So a place, a street that potentially you can close during major event that is part of Again, the entire experience there. We do have um, the transformation of the North Edge. What we're looking is currently when the first the campus first started, you know, around Building C, around college, um, that was where the main entry 
was. But as the campus continued to evolve, um, there's no longer like a single front door. So we have to acknowledge that people come from uh, from the, from the uh, the BRT, from the the busway. They come from the south, but also there's the transit that's happening on Wajak. So acknowledging that there are, you know, along all of its edges that we have a new way to enter the campus, all of those have to be very welcoming, very safe, very easy, but also very recognizable. And that's why you'll see that we're spending a lot of time along Navajo to ensure that that edge, that frontage, uh, demonstrate, you know, the changes, the image of the campus to make it more attractive, more interesting. We also, I'm just going to go back, uh, within the campus, and you see this is the We've mapped the existing, you know, the existing pedestrian path within the corridors, within the, the campus. We want to make sure that as student continues to walk to come from transit or come from various destinations, that it's a very safe, intuitive area to walk with. And then some of them is planned for when we have new buildings, projects coming forward, that we actually know where these future connections within buildings are and how they connect to these external doors so people come in and it's very easy to uh, very easy to navigate. And we identified a couple of places that have issues today that those again it's planned for improvement in the future. Oh the, the public realm. That's one of the key. You know, we've heard from everyone that we've interviewed, like you know, the importance of a high quality space of attracting people to go to the college. They want people want a sustainable green environment. So a streetscape along along streets, uh, so they actually it's very comfortable to walk. It's very safe. Uh, we're, oops, as mentioned by Tim, enhancing that new open that big large open centralized place. Uh, in, in the center of the campus really is a place for gathering for informal place or very much the heart of the campus um, along the southern end we have maintaining that kind of that green uh, that green space the green transition space between the the, uh, the neighborhood to the south and to the east to actually create is very sensitive and trying to and then looking at way to enhance that space to make it even more attractive than it is today the horticultural uh, garden is being maintained it's a jewel within the campus has to be maintained it's really part of the image of the of the college and and as well as there's a couple of places around Wajak, around the south end there, where we see an increase in pedestrianization, pedestrian, we call them pedestrian-centric street, where it's really safe for a pedestrian to walk to and from into these, these area. This is, this is that signature green space, a place for, uh, where the learners, the employees can come together, have informal gathering, you can have your organ organized event, you can have your, your fair there, your job fair could actually be in, uh, in there in, the, in terms of when you have those gathering at the beginning of the year, maybe it's your, com your convocation that can happen in that location, but it's very much part of a new, you know, creating a very strong identity for the college of creating a, a central green and this is something that not all buildings are there today because we have indicated here in one of a uh, lot eight that this is a site for future buildings but it's setting the stage and like we don't think that this is not a place for a building it's a place for an open space but we can frame that open space with really much of active use onto uh, onto the campus. And here's a view. This is a view looking north uh, toward uh, this is this is where the existing student residents are. This is the uh, student common, the Jack Doyle, the Arc buildings. Uh, this is the building that's not there today, but you can imagine when, you know, again, it's having that vision, that plan, so that we know how that transformation is going to happen over, over, um, over time. And this is something that's going to improve um, the attractivity of the, of the, of the plan. Um, that, you know, we, we talk a lot about this, the green edges along the, uh, along the neighborhood is very important. This is a place where continue to plant trees in terms of maintaining the uh, the, gar the the food uh, the, f the food farm the urban farm the architectural um, the architect you know what I mean 
and uh, the, storm, the storm water pond. So that is planned to be continue to be maintained and, and, and enhanced. So it's, it's kind of a green, a kind of a, a, a green connection, having some path, having some activities that can continue to happen there. And it's a place that's meant to be welcoming for everyone, for employers, for staff, but also the community that, you know, we want the campus to be ports and anyone being, you know, that it's, it's, it's invited into the place. From a land use perspective, um, it's just about organizing the uses. So what you see in purple is the places where you generally see, and it's, is what it's representative of today, which is where the academic spaces are. But as the, continue, continue, the campus continue to, to evolve, we see also that there are areas where we think that these are the existing residents, but we see in those sites that you see in that kind of salmon color, it's where we see that, you know, places where we can mix the uses. So places that would be appropriate for student resident above and academic buildings below. So the first two, three floor would be academic space and potentially student housing right on top. Um, and it's important we feel to focus it as much as possible into really an area and into you know, a place that is, that is here to the north, because this is also where we see a lot of the activities uh, happening. Um, where you see these these red line there, this is also the places where we want to focus the where we think those are the most critical place where we want activities at the ground floor of buildings. So it could be restaurant, bookstores, it could be, and you know there are uses that are can be quite interesting happening within the building. So see how we can externalize some of these so that there's actually a good porosity and visibility. So so it's not a mystery about what's happening inside inside the buildings. Uh, also, as we continue to, to grow, uh, making sure that the program, the department, are well organized. It's important that you know, to foster a culture of belonging within each of the programs. So understanding where health, wellness, about technology, admin, business, the, the, the trades. So that is something we also are keeping in mind. Right now, there are some department that are sometimes a little bit spread. We want to ensure that as one of the direction is to try to rationalize and make sure that they are in the right in the right place. And then finally, this is understanding where and where to build, uh, where to so there you'll see. There are some place some buildings that you see in the uh, with the hatched. Uh, those are the buildings that have major defer maintenance. Those are the buildings that over time we see that are likely to be demolished versus the other pinks, uh, pink area. Those are the devel other development site and those are generally the existing parking. Uh, there are existing parking. It's not all of them because we're maintaining these parking lot that are on the on the east end right now of the, the eastern edge of the of the campus. But this is, gives us a, a, a road map about defining the boundary of these sites so that we know where open space are going to be, where circulation is going to be, where the buildings are going to be are, are going to be planned. And here's a picture of that, you know, that long term. And this is this is a long term. This is 25 years plus. It's probably more like 50 or 60 years down the road. But again, it's important to have a plan so everyone around here understand how we're going to grow. It doesn't become a mystery and then um, there's, there's a lot of certainty for the college and for everyone, uh, citizen that lives around here that understand how that, that growth is happening. So this is a view looking, uh, looking north and then we do have here a view, um, a view looking looking south, and this is this is Woodrow Navajo. Uh, this is a place, and I'll talk in detail a bit more detail on uh, this. This is that central open space, and then you could see here the green edge along the campus. That's the existing soccer field, and um, and then that's 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 that vision. Just this is a question: How do we start? What do we build first? Um, very important to understand. We, we see that the first, the first three sites that we would start are three that are at the kind of northern end. Uh, so the site F, 
uh, which is the, um, uh, the one right adjacent to the existing student residence, H, which is the current, it's the hospitality program, and A, which has a mixture of, um, of, uh, of, of program in it, and that's the one that's like the oldest part of the campus. Those are the places that are the most appropriate, the most um, critical uh, from strategically to start. This decision is like, you know, looking at demolition on, you know, this decision are based on, on these short or short term objectives is if there is so much deferred maintenance, it usually means it's actually much cheaper to demolish than trying to fix them. And even if you fix them, you get buildings that are actually underperforming and are not good for the long term. Um, upgrade the and replace some of the facility at the end of the life uh, end of life. For example, we do have lots of deferred maintenance on the, or it's more like the culinary labs are getting to the end of their lifespan. They needs to have major investment, and these kitchens are actually very price, uh, very uh, costly. So something we have to be very smart about how we use our money. Um, one thing we're going to do in the short term: we need to accommodate more classroom. These classrooms uh, that we're going to build are going to help us to be able to decommission, decant other buildings so that we can already plan the next stage of the building. Because that's the thing, you need to create more room on those front end buildings so that you can actually are able to actually free the space so you can move to the next one. Uh, we do have, you know, I think that the, we want to build that, the fact that we're developing that northern edge first is because this is where we want to show um, the, that, that academic excellence. We really want to transform the image. We want to build additional student housing. Now, we don't quite know the numbers yet, but there's a parallel study happening, you know, is it a 400, is it 500, is it 600? I think there's going to be a series of stages there in terms of uh, understanding how many we built, but we are, this is currently being, being studied. Um, improving the image on Navajo, support the city's planned transit initiative, so that's why we want to connect to that future BRT and continue to replace you know, the buildings around, uh, around Lot A, because those are the place strategically is, is, are the best served by future transit. And we're going to continue to advance our sustainability goal with very high performing building. This is building, this is what we refer to as the Site F, this is the one that is just west of the existing residence, north of the, uh, of the student common. Um, as a first, this is where we anticipate the first building is going to occur. So we see it as a building that has about three levels of academic space at the base of the buildings. Uh, culinary school, as a, the hospitality program, as well as uh, as a classroom space, so that's going to help us to decant on the next phase. And we think it's a great opportunity to start building right above it some student housing, uh, which is much needed. So in the place that is in the right place, close to transit, at the heart of the center of the of the campus, to be able to create that synergy in that in that area of the campus. Um, as a second move, uh, they would be to take building H, which has the hospitality program, decant it, and then, you know, at that point, continue to expand the academic and space within the base of the buildings. And then we're going to reevaluate how much student housing we need at that point. Now, so there is the option that you can continue to have student housing right on top of that building, or maybe you can have more academic buildings. So again, that's something that as we continue to evolve the, uh, and understand the enrollment better, it's where we would then make some final decision about how, how, you know, how much space we need to create. And then finally, we do have the north portion of building A. So this is the area that is right to the west of the existing uh, hospitality program. Again, this is very old building, lots of defer maintenance, they're not worth keeping. And this is a place where we would be adding new academic space. So some, and then potentially again, if we have the needs, more student housing into that building. And here's the, this is that, we're looking here uh, above the intersection of Woodruff and Navajo, and the kind of transformation that we see here over time. This is 
This is the site F that I just mentioned. This is the transform area of, um, of, uh, of site A. We've ghosted, you know, what could be the student resident. Again, this is just an idea about how it, would, it could be on that site. Uh, this is on the site A. And then we've also on lot one, which is currently a parking lot, we're showing that, you know, in the future it's been identified as as a new building, a new gateway that really would anchor that corner. So again, you can see it's quite exciting. Like it's a lot of changes that we see over time to really improve the quality of the environment, the quality of, of, of the campus. And with that, I will invite Ryan uh, back to the podium and for questions and comments. So I would like to thank the team uh, for the presentation today. Uh, and I'd like to open up the floor now for questions and answer portion of the session. Uh, so for those that are in person, uh, please raise your hand and we'll bring a mic over so that you can ask your question live and keep our Algon College values of caring, learning and respect at top of mind when asking questions. Uh, for those that are online, unfortunately, there's not an ability to ask questions live, but there will be a survey going out later. But if there are any questions, and I, I recognize we are running a little bit behind time, uh, but happy to take questions that we have right now. So one here to start us off. Hi, um, my name is Nancy Wilson, and I just have a question about, you've talked about consultation um, for the last few years on this project. And I'm just wondering why our community was never consulted the City View community. Yeah, so when we consulted with the college first to understand where the desires were to, to go forward, we had a lot of options that were provided. And so we've worked down through the last year and a half to try and narrow down the options and address so that we're not coming to you with six different variations of what could happen. We, we narrowed it down to sort of the, the first three that we thought, because at, at one point we were looking at developing north, we were looking at developing south and east, and so we've narrowed that down in order to try and have that consultation so that we could actually have a reasonable conversation with the surrounding communities and understand what our intentions were going forward so that we could take your feedback. We felt that if we, if we came too early into the process, you wouldn't, it would be just too much to understand and, and what the various options were going to be. So we, we try to narrow it down and, and go for that that way. That was the, the logic behind it at this point. Yeah, if uh, I'm sure we can work something with uh, both myself and my team and, and work, if there is interest for, from, a, from a community associate for yourself uh, specifically, we can definitely work through that. Yes. I would ask too, like if there are community associations that want to, like please send me the information. Uh, my contact will be or should be on, or there should be a general inbox email on the, uh, the survey. Please send that to me and then and a point of contact that we can reach out and connect. Yes, here. Yeah, two things uh, that you didn't mention and maybe it's intentional. Um, there's no uh, projection of student enrollment, so we don't know what you're thinking about in terms of what's happening to the number of people on campus, which obviously affects size and uh, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And there's no mention at all on any expansion of the campus, so I presume somebody made a decision that you're landlocked where you are and you can't expand. Is that, can you comment on that? So I, I on the enrollment piece, I think we're, we're working through a period of flux, to be honest, with, with where things are um, and, and the announcements that are continuing to go forward. So what we have presented to the college community at the beginning of this process versus what we've come uh, is, is, I wouldn't say vastly different. We've, we've changed the focus on, on what it is and looking at the deferred maintenance piece. Um, we are working through, the college is working through enrollment projections and understanding where we are going to go over the next five years, over the next 10 years, and trying to understand what that is going to look like and how our facilities need to develop in order to in, in address that strategic direction. The strategic plan is also being reviewed and uh, developed for the college overall. On the landlocked piece, I, I don't believe we are looking at being landlocked here uh, within the campus. We have plenty of space for development over the next 50 to 60 years, 
But as, I, as was mentioned, we are going to be evaluating when the O train arrives and understand how that operationalizes. What are the requirements for parking space and what are the next opportunities moving forward? But I would say um, there, if there was an opportunity for partnerships and growth uh, and, and engaging with a true partnership, I don't think that that would be out of, out of sight as well. Um, I also mentioned at the beginning, we talked about the Perth and Pembroke campuses as well. So we, we already have satellite campuses that we are looking at and there are engagements at, with those campuses and, and the surrounding communities as well. Any other, uh, one back here and then uh, next, and then I think that might be it, but happy to answer any questions after uh, as part of the open house. Um, quick question, with back, I, I live in a house backing onto your property just over here. Uh, I do have concerns with things like the horticultural building where you have a single story building and now it looks like there's three stories, four stories high that you're going to put in for the horticultural building right on the edge of the property. So speaking, I don't know whether any of those people are here. I don't think they are because the only reason I found out is thank goodness for the community association because I never heard from it from Algonquin. There's no postings on any social sites. Even Lynn Johnson's site, I prompted them to get the posting from that they'd posted. Because it, it, there's a multitude of sites, and it's no fault of anybody, but it's, it's hard to get in touch with all the areas. But in those, area, those properties, the last thing anybody that has a house along here is, wants to have is an industrial building straight up behind them. In my, my house, the only reason I, it's, it works is because we have all those those beautiful pine trees in behind, which I hope they stay. But if they don't stay, I, you know, we know that Algonquin has already applied for and received approval to have those trees taken down. Because that was 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that was what was told to us. You do have permission to take them down. So we, but there's a bunch of things like that. So we're concerned over what is and what isn't but we think with your architectural group here, if there's some way to look at it from the other side, when you're looking at Algonquin, if you're looking at it from the, from the south side, you're building up towards the north side. If you keep that in there, that becomes a nice buffer zone for Ryan Farm, which is mm -hmm. right behind you on the south side, and City View on the west side, or east side. Uh, all of that taken into account. As you said, it's, it's a guideline. We're hoping it's a guideline and not a fixed principle to build up and against the property lines. Yes, yeah, so I'll start, I'll start with that and then I'll turn it over to Eric and Tim to, to comment. So as part of the city guidelines as well, like within building uh, around the LRT station, there is an ability to build up within a certain circumference from the LRT station. But there is also an acknowledgement and part of the secondary plan that the city will be doing that we need to respect the existing communities and have graduated uh, height or restrictions on height going forward as well within bu buffering up. And that's why we spent a lot of time talking today about that green buffer along the south and the east portion of the campus. So I, I, I'll have to take back that, that, that pine tree, the cutting down of the trees. Like I'm not planning on cutting down any trees on the campus right now. The only thing we're doing is maintaining and, and trying to address that going forward. Uh, so I'll have to go back and take a look at that from the archives, but we're, we're trying to make sure that that graduated, the, we build up on the north end and then gradually as we move to the south and to the east, it's, it's more um, soft, softer uh, development. The BRT shows that the bus route is coming down Navajo, uh, off uh, baseline along Navajo out to Woodruff, just the way the buses were told to us 12 years ago it was going to be, and then Algonquin dragged them down service corridor and out College Avenue. Uh, your BRT plan shows it coming down Navajo and out to Woodruff. Is Algonquin planning to bring that BRT through service road and out College Avenue? No, so once the bus rapid transit receives funding and is developed, the, the Route 88, which goes through the campus right now, will move back onto that BRT rapid or that bus rapid transit line. So there will not be bus stops within the Ottawa campus. It'll be on that north, either at the 
the Algonquin Station or the bus and their bus rapid transit piece, or along the north part of Navajo um, as part of that bus rapid transit system that's being developed. Okay, thanks. And there was one more here. Yes. So. Online. Forget about them. Hi, um, my name is Terry Hutchins. I've lived next to Algonquin College since 1980. I live on Lotta Avenue. I'm the last house that abuts the property at Algonquin. I appreciate Algonquin and its place in the community. I, when I retired, I did teach here for 10 years. So I value education. I have a number of concerns or issues, and I thought this would be a maybe just my own personal issues, but seeing the power brokers are here, this might be a good time to raise the issues. Um, my number one concern is, is drainage. There's a property that you own that's opposite me, 122 Lotta, that's for sale. That property, since the berm has been built between that property and the soccer pitch, when it rains heavy, such as the rainfall in August of a year before, there'd be a, at least minimum of a foot of water in that property. It drains all towards my land and onto my property. During the rainstorm, I had to go out and dig a ditch to have the wa water drain down to extend the care. Uh, so that's an issue for me. The fact now is that the property there is up for sale. If anyone wants to buy it, they're asking 535. Um, again, when that property is built, that's going to take away more land drainage because there'll be less uh, surface for drainage. So again, there'll be even more water collected between that property and the berm, which is bordering my property. So if one could look into drainage, I've raised this issue with Algon Algonquin before and nothing happened. Um, being the last house on Lotta, I also get probably a couple hundred people a day walking past my house. It's a main access point to the east side to the college. Uh, generally speaking, the students have been very good. Uh, so I haven't had a major issue with them, just occasional, but nothing dramatic. One of my concerns is, would be the issue of parking. Um, I spoke to a student today on my street who parks at a neighbor's house. Uh, he told me that the registration for all your parking lots are full, so he has no access. He's renting a, a driveway from my neighbor, which is fine, except for when our street becomes a parking lot for Algonquin, especially for the soccer dome and soccer pitch. Um, our street gets full of, of cars. I did speak to someone here. I, I've, I've met at, with college officials three times. On the third time, I got some help because they began to combine, to some degree, the parking uh, in the parking lot with the dome and the use of the field. Mm -hmm. Before that, there were times when you couldn't get down my street. Uh, one garbage truck actually came down one day. This was years ago. I've now got no parking on one side, but our street is still used as a parking lot for Algonquin. So my concern would be, are, are you taking away more parking? And therefore, people will be parking on our streets, side streets. Um, I do want to thank uh, the property people who have been involved with me over the years, uh, Bev Haslegrove and uh, your current person, Amanda. They've been really good to deal with. Uh, they've helped me with a number of issues. I appreciate that. Um, Just looking at my notes here. Um, one of the things, again, is, and I, mean, I know this is not related to development, but people having access to the Algonquin property, dogs off leashes. I'm afraid of dogs. And they often run from Algonquin onto my property and then often leave dog poo and stuff. Other people don't clean up after their dogs. I clean up that area. Some people collect dog poo in bags and leave it beside the rocks at the end of the, at the, end of the street, which again, I clean up. Um, Beverly offered me to put a garbage can there. I said no, because it'll just become a dog poo thing. So she didn't do it. So I really appreciated her when she was here. Um, so 
So I'll maybe just take an opportunity to yeah, respond okay. to some some of those. So uh, you've highlighted the the parking piece, and we have engaged uh, with with numerous groups on along Lotta Avenue and and residents in order to try and, and bring that forward. And I'll I'll, I'll, hi, I'll highlight the campus services has worked with the, the students association in order to try and align that, and and worked with the city as well in order to try and make sure that that is being we put the signs up there for no parking and making sure that by law enforcement goes and and does do that walkthrough. For the parking piece, we are for future developments looking at how do we how do we address that parking piece and, and going that going forward. Um, I am I am cognizant of time. Uh, I'll, I know you've got one more point there, but I, I'm happy to, to talk about this afterwards and, and gather your 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 direct feedback, and we can address that. The only thing in terms of parking, um, I wish that Algonquin would include the parking for the dome and the use of the soccer pitch in their fees. That used to happen so that students and users of the field never parked on our street. Now it's better. I think the fees have been reduced, but at the same time, we're still getting lots of parking because people are refusing to pay that fee. So my suggestion was that if the fees for parking were included in the fees for use of the field and dome, I think that would set yeah, with that and, problem. And that has moved forward as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, I'd like to thank everyone for attending uh, tonight. Um, and so we've reached the end of the event. Um, for those that are registered via email, we will be sending a survey out uh, and ask that you provide your feedback in that survey and if we have any consultation going forward. Uh, and then af as mentioned, there is an open house uh, after this event. And so those in person are happy, we're happy to engage with you, walk through the panels, answer your questions, or engage one-on-one -on -one with concerns that you have as, as community members and with the college. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Have a great night.